Hello there and you are welcome once again to the light of life. In our last episode, we started a teaching series titled Exploring the Faithfulness of God. And in the course of that teaching, we were able to establish that to understand the faithfulness of God, that there are three major factors that underline it. We said that the first is the will of God, the second is the process of God, and then the third is the appointed season of God. We would establish in the last teaching also that the faithfulness of God is strictly to his will, not just our own will, but majorly to his own will. And when our will aligns with his will, then we can experience his faithfulness. Today we'll be taking it a step further by looking at the processes of God. And it's my prayer that as you follow this teaching today, light will come to you and you will receive clarity on many issues that bother in your Christian walk. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for another opportunity that we have to come and learn at your feet. Thank you for your truth that continues to lighten our pathway in destiny. We ask, O oh God, that you will speak to us, O oh God, in the language that we can understand today. And let your word come to empower us and elevate us even to the place that you have ordained that we should be in our walk with you. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, the faithfulness of God, like I told you, is primarily to his will. And one of the things that shows how faithful God is, is the process that he takes us through in order for that purpose of his to become fulfilled in our lives. If God sees that there are certain processes that you need to go through so that his will for your life, to which he's absolutely and unreservedly committed, can be fulfilled in your life, and he looks away from it, either because you are crying for pain or you are talking about the fact that you don't like those, those kind of processes, it simply means that he is not faithful or he is not committed to his own will concerning your life. But because God is a faithful God, he will always take you through processes that will enable you to arrive at the place where his, his, his plan and purpose for your life can be fulfilled. We were able to establish in the course of the last teaching that the will of God refers to the purpose, the plan, and the intentions of God concerning any matter. Now, why is it important for us to go through processes? When God created man in the Garden of Eden, as we see in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and verse Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, God enabled man or equipped him with everything that he requires to fulfill his purpose. That is everything that he needs to be able to do the will of God for his life. We see this in the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 when God says, let us make man in our own image and after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every creeping thing and then over every cattle. God armed man with his image, with his likeness and then with dominion that man required to do that which God wanted him to do. And that was why he blessed him in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, when he said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. The blessing was released into the life of man by God so that he can accomplish the purpose for which God created him. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible says that God took the man that he had formed and placed him in a garden in the east of Eden, a garden that he had planted. And he gave man an assignment in that place that man should dress and keep the garden. It means that he should cultivate and keep the garden. There was no need for man to go through any form of training because man had already been equipped by God to do that work of cultivating and also keeping or nurturing the garden. But as a result of the fall of man, man lost the capacity that God gave unto him 
to be able to fulfill the assignment of God for his life or for him to be able to do the will of God for his life. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, the Bible says that out of the dust, excuse me, of the earth, that God formed man and breathed into him the breath of life and man became a living soul. That living soul, we see a demonstration of it in Genesis chapter 2 verse 19 when the Bible says that out of the dust of the ground, God formed every beast and brought them unto man to see what he would call them. And that whatsoever man called them, that was the name thereof. So God had given that ability to perceive unto man at the beginning. And that was why he could do the work of identifying what was in the mind of God regarding every creature that God brought to him and he gave them names according to the will of God. But when man fell, the Bible says that one of the first things that happened after he ate of the tree that God told him not to eat from was that their eyes were opened. That's him and his wife. The implication of this was not it's not that man's eyes were blind before is that the sense of man or the way man was perceiving his environment was beyond the realm of the senses it was because of the soul that he had that was powered by the life of god that came from the breath of god that was about described him as a living soul his fall therefore caused all of that ability to diminish and it became reduced to his senses so his eyes seen at that point in time when his eyes becoming opened meant that his ability to perceive now became reduced to his five senses the things that he could see with his eyes the things that he could taste with his tongue the things that he could feel with his skin the things that he could smell with his nose And all of those other things like that. The five senses, majorly. So, the sense of touch, of smell, of taste, of feeling, and of sight. All of those things now became the primary reason or the primary medium which which man began to relate with his environment. God wanted by far more for him. And therefore, because he lost the nature of God and carried the nature of sin. He became incapable of fulfilling the purpose of God for his life. So because of this, for any man therefore to be able to fulfill the purpose of God for his life, there is need for God to do a work in that person's life, to bring him into a place where he is able to move beyond the realm of his senses and then be able to perceive under the leading of the spirit of god so that he can fulfill the purpose of god his senses became the dominant force in his life and his soul became relegated to the background for him to be able to do the will of god His senses have to be relegated to the background and the soul that God has given unto him, that living soul that is in him, now has to receive more of the life of God and then become elevated to the point that it is with that sense or it is with that soul that is able to perceive his environment, which was actually the original plan of God. Now, Because the senses that he had, with which he was relating with his environment, had now become his primary primary, uh, medium of interaction or a primary medium of uh, seeing things, those things now have to be subdued and subjected. The process by which these things, these senses, or man's dependence on his senses now become reduced is what we describe as suffering. Suffering in the context of the Christian faith is not that somebody begins to beat you 
it is you losing your confidence in your senses, your natural senses. That is your ability to perceive your environment only on the basis of what your eyes can see, what your ears can hear, what your nose can smell, what your tongue can taste, and what your hand can feel. If you are going to fulfill the will of God, you must learn how to live beyond this realm. And God takes men through a process that would make them relegate those senses to the background and depend on him. That's why the Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. One version says we walk by faith and not by sensory perceptions. So walking by faith is simply us looking beyond that which our natural senses can perceive and depending on God, depending on the information that he puts in our soul so that we can fulfill his purpose for our lives. That is why when God called Abraham, the first and most important thing in God's dealing with him is to bring him into a place where he's able to depend on God and look beyond his senses. The Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness, which means he was no longer looking at what his eyes could see, looking at the deadness of Sarah's womb or looking at the fact that he himself had become old and maybe not able to father a child at the age of 100 anymore. He came to a place where he's able to trust God enough to leave his comfort zone and go to a place where he's a stranger and a sojourner moving to and fro. He had to come to a place where he could rely absolutely on God, depending on the word of God alone, the information that God puts in his soul in order for him to be able to do the will of God. So all that he went through, those 25 years, between the time that God called him when he was 75 years and 100 years when he eventually experienced the fulfillment of the promise in receiving Isaac as the child of promise, is what in his own case is described as suffering. So suffering is simply the process by which the flesh is subdued so that the soul can come into a place where it takes dominance as a result of the life of God flowing into it through the word of God, which is life and coming to give light into his heart. The Bible tells us in the book of John chapter 1, verse 5, it says, in him is life, it's talking about the word of God, and that life is the light of men. And the light shines in darkness and darkness cannot comprehend it. Which means when we receive the word of God, we receive that light. And that light enables us to navigate the darkness that is reigning in this world. And then we are able to walk the path that God has ordained for us and we are able to fulfill his will. God therefore takes us through the process of suffering, which is always unpalatable, so that we can come into a place where his purpose, that is his will for our life, can be fulfilled. So it is because of the faithfulness of God to his will for our lives that it takes us through sufferings and difficulties at times. The Bible tells us in the book of First Peter chapter 5, And verse 10, it says, And the God of all grace, who called you unto his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, will himself make you perfect, establish you, strengthen you, and settle you. The New Heart English Bible says, And the God of all grace, who called you into his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a while, will himself restore confirm, strengthen, and settle you. So for you to come into a place where God perfects you, it begins with him taking you through the process of suffering. 
So it's not like God is unconcerned about the processes that we go through and the pains that we feel when we go through those processes. In fact, the reason why he allows us or makes us go through those processes is because he is faithful to us to ensure that his dream and his purpose for our lives find fulfillment. That is why we should not despise our suffering. Apostle Paul understood this very clearly when he said in the book of Philippians chapter 3 from verse 11, he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering be made conformable unto his death. He understood that that suffering is crucial. That's why he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 27, he says, I therefore put my body in subjection daily, lest after I have preached unto others, I myself become a castaway. He knows that God wants to fulfill his purpose for his life. And that's why God takes him through the process that he goes through in order for the purpose of God for his life to become a material manifestation, to become something that is seen, that is substan- substantial, something that he's seen and others also see. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, I told you that that first chapter 5, verse 10 says that the God of all grace, who called you unto his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, says, will himself make you perfect. What does it mean for one to become perfect? When God created man, everything in the tripartite nature of man aligned. The body, the soul, and the spirit of man were all in alignment. And that was why man was a living soul. However, because of the fall, man began to get ruled by his senses. His soul got devoid of life because he now became governed by death. Because God told him that in the day that you eat of this tree, that you should not eat from, that you will die. And therefore, death entered into him and death began to reign over his soul. So, his body also, death began to reign in it. But when a man comes into a place where he wants to fulfill the purpose of God for his life, God gives him the gift of the Spirit first and foremost. That's why you will see in the Old Testament, whenever somebody wants to be anointed or or wants to be called to do a specific assignment for God, that person is set apart either by the Spirit of God coming upon him or an oil, the anointing of coming upon that person's being poured upon the person's head and then the spirit of god coming upon we see this in the anointing of saul and also in the anointing of david we see it in the prophets how the spirit of god will come upon them so that they can declare the will of god and proclaim the counsel of the most high so the spirit of god becomes the starting point when the spirit of man comes alive as a result of the spirit of god illuminating that heart there is now need for him to align his body and his soul with the information that is already in his spirit that comes from the word of God. When these three align, that is when you become perfect. When the spirit of God in you is able to bring your soul and your body in alignment with the will of God, then you are perfect. That's why the Bible says that you would make that He would make us perfect after we have suffered a while. Which means the purpose of suffering is actually to make us perfect. The Bible says concerning Jesus, He said it pleased God to cause Him to suffer. He says that that he may make him perfect through suffering. The one that is actually the apostle of our faith. He says that he pleased the Lord to make him perfect. That's concerning Jesus. Through suffering. Don't forget 
that even Jesus Christ himself, though he was God, he was still man. That's why he had to learn. The Bible says in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, that he increased in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and man, which means he had to learn certain things. He learned obedience. The Bible says that he learned obedience in the things that he suffered. So when talking about obedience or perfection, it is the body and the soul of a man coming into alignment in what, with what God has put in his spirit. Remember I told you in the last teaching that the purpose of the process that God takes us through is to bring us into alignment with his will. This is why you must not despise your suffering. People don't have to understand what you are going through. As long as you know you are a child of God, please don't despise what you are going through because God is working something out in you. That's why he says in the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 29, that all things work together for good for them that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. So whatever it is that you are going through that you don't understand, never see it as a sign that God has rejected you. Never see it as a sign that your prayers are despised by God. No. Just understand that there are certain things that you need to go through for God to work on you so that you can come into a place of perfection. Remember in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, from verse 11, the Bible says that he gave gifts unto men, that he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. That was the number one purpose. Yes, talk about the work of the ministry and then the edification of the body till we come to the unity of the faith of, and of the knowledge of the Son of God and of, to come to the place where we come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. All of those things are important. But what he begins with is the perfecting of the sins, which perfection occurs through suffering. That's why it says in Philippians chapter 1 from verse 28, it says that, and in nothing be be terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. He says, because not only is it given unto you to be glorified with him, but also to suffer with him. And that's why you know that we know that when we suffer with him, we shall also be glorified with him. So that suffering is part of the package to make us perfect, bring us into a place of Total alignment with the will and the purpose of God for our lives. Now, there are three main stages in this process of suffering. Or let me say, there are three main things that happen. The first is that God takes us through a process of training. When, where he develops our capacity. I'm going to give you an example in the life of Joseph. I'm going to explain that to you using his life as a case study so you will see what I'm talking about. So the first thing that God does is that he trains us. He increases our capacity because we have, as a result of sin, lost that installed capacity that God gave unto man at the beginning. And therefore, to bring us into a place of that installed capacity, he needs to increase our capacity again. How? By bringing us into a place of faith where we depend on him and do not walk in the flesh. Hallelujah. The second thing is that he brings us into a place of pruning, which means excesses, the things that we are not supposed to be doing or that can lead to us derailing our own purpose our ability to fulfill that purpose of God for our lives, he removes it from our lives. You know, when you see a, a, a large block and the sculptor begins to work on it, he begins to chisel out the different excess parts so that the image can come out and become properly formed. That is what happens. The transformation occurs because of the chiseling, because of the pruning, when God removes the excesses, the things that can allow the enemy, the snake, to hide 
and do evil through us. Many people don't understand this thing. The Bible describes us as the planting of God. Why is this important? Just because even describes us as the vine and that every one that produces fruit, his father prunes. Now, why is pruning important? Pruning is the way excess branches or overweight or overhanging branches are removed from a particular plant so that there can be room for it to grow better and also bring forth fruits so that there will not be things taking uh, unnecessary uh, measure of the nutrients from it. Now, if a tree or a plant is not pruned, it means that there will be hiding place for snakes and many dangerous animals. And if we are trees that God wants people to partake as an of, who, of which God wants people to partake of our fruits. It means that as people come to partake of the fruits, they are also exposed to those dangerous animals that are hidden in those trees because of the hiding place that those excess baggage allow them. So if God wants you to be properly uh, positioned, to be able to be a blessing, He removes those excesses so that there will be no hiding place for snakes. In the same way, the characters of the enemy, the works of the flesh, that can make people not be able to receive the full benefits of what God has for them in your life. When God is pruning you, he removes those things so that you can be fruitful and it will be safe for people to come and partake of the fruits of your life. So that's why pruning is very important. And it's part of the process that God brings us through to bring us into a place of alignment. He says, anyone that, any tree that brings forth fruit, his father prunes, that he may bring forth more fruit. That is the purpose of God. That is, that he says, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen that you and ordained you that you may go forth and bring forth much fruit, and that your fruit may abide. May abide. Hallelujah. And the third thing that God does by taking us through the process of suffering is to prove us. Hallelujah. He takes us that process to prove us, because if you are not proven, especially to yourself, you will not know where your weaknesses are, and therefore you will not know how to make proper adjustments where necessary. I'm going to give you an example in closing with the story of Joseph so that we will see why suffering was necessary in his life. When Joseph was in his father's house, there were three major flaws that were growing in his life. God gave him a vision and in that vision, God wanted him to be a leader. That was why he had a dream in Two different types of dreams in which he saw himself being a leader. But for somebody to be a leader and to have those excesses or those kind of traits and character flaws in his life, God knew that that would not be proper and therefore there was need for God to work with those flaws. What were those flaws? The first was that he had no sense of responsibility. His father did not give him any work to do. How can you be a leader and you don't have a sense of responsibility? That is disastrous. The second was that he was insensitive. He was no more than a tailbearer. He was always looking for the flaws of his brothers and reporting it to his father. All he was seeing were the flaws of his brother. He wasn't seeing their good qualities. And that is a very bad thing for a leader. And the third was that he lacked discretion. He could say anything he wanted to say as long as that was what was on his mind. And those are dangerous character traits in anyone that's going to be a leader. And this was exactly how his father was raising him. With those flaws, he was over-pampering him 
not knowing that he was actually making him unfit for the purpose of God for his life. For him, therefore, to be able to fulfill the purpose of God for his life, God, excuse me, had to take him through a process that would elevate his capacity such that he would be able to align in body, soul, and spirit with the purpose of God for his life. How did God do it? The first thing was that God allowed him to be sold into slavery. Remember, he himself made reference to it, that it was God that sent him when his brothers Brother, I went to meet him. He said, God sent him ahead of them to preserve life. We also see in the book of Psalm 105, from verse 11 when to 21, when the Bible says that God sent a man after, ahead of them, the man Joseph. So it was God that actually orchestrated that. Why? Because he wanted him to be in the house of Potiphar. What was it that was doing in the house of Potiphar? He had responsibilities. He was going to be a good leader, he needed to learn how to develop capacity for responsibilities. And God gave that to him. And he was in the house of Potiphar. Everything was committed into his hands and he excelled in it. Why? Because those abilities were in him already. But he needed to be in a place of training where those abilities can come out. And that was where God took him to. The second was that he needed to look beyond the flaws of people and see how he could help them. And that was why God took him to prison. When he was in prison, he himself was the one that saw the baker and the butler and appealed unto them. He was in charge of the prison. He could have said, why are you guys just sitting down there? Get up and go and get your job done. He was the one that was directing the affairs of things there. But he showed concern for how they felt. And mercy, empathy, is a very important trait for anyone that is going to be a leader. So him going to prison gave him the opportunity to learn that. And we saw that in what he displayed to the baker and butler. He went to them and said, why is your countenance falling? What is it? Tell me what the problem is. And those guys told him their problems, and he showed concern for them. He was able to solve their problem for them to the best of his ability at that point in time. Now, the third thing was that, like I told you when he was in his father's house, he could say anything he wanted to say without caring whose ox is God. But by the time he was appearing in the house of Pharaoh, he had learned how to talk. When he stood in front of Pharaoh, in fact, the Bible says before he was going to stand in front of Pharaoh, he shaved his beard and changed his clothes because he understood that there was a way to appear before the king. He was no longer doing things the way he liked. He now understood that there was a way to do things. And when he stood in front of Pharaoh and Pharaoh spoke to him, he answered those questions the best way possible in humility, no longer with arrogance, no longer with indiscretion, the one he was using to talk to his brothers. Now he answered quietly and he humbly, Lord, the Lord will give unto Pharaoh an answer of peace. He saw the interpretation and after giving the interpretation, he didn't say, I'm a man that could solve the problem. He said, let Pharaoh seek out a man that can do this, that can do that. If it was the former Joseph, he would have just said, I can do it. And just thrown himself out there. So, all of these things, God took him through so that he can come into a place where he will be fit to do the work of God. And you would see eventually when he was able to preserve life because he showed mercy not only to his brothers but to the entire nation of Israel when the famine started biting hard on them because God had worked on him. He had gone through the process of God and arrived at a place where he became fit for the master's use. I urge you today not to despise your pain. Whatever it is that you are going through that you have no understanding of, just trust God. Because your ability to depend on him is paramount. Your ability to trust him 
when you don't understand what is going on in your life, is key to you being able to be to fulfill his purpose for your life. The reason why you are going through this process is so that the master can bring you into alignment with his will for your life. What you need to go through will be different from what some other person will need to go through. There are those who short circuit their process, who go out of it, or who never learn from it, and therefore are unfit for God's use. But if you will endure hardness as a true soldier of Christ, and you will do the things that God wants you to do, endure this suffering, I assure you, eventually, God will bring you into your prepared place. I close with Psalm 66 from verse 10 to 12, which I would like you to read. It says, Thou, O Lord, has proven us. You, O God, has tried us. It says, You have laid affliction upon our soul. You have tried us as silver is tried. It says, we are, you, laid, you laid a net upon our feet. We went through the fire and through the water, but you brought us into a wealthy place. The destination is a wealthy place, but God took them through the process of men riding over their head, of men going through different places that God didn't want, that in that day would not have loved to be. God has a glorious destination for you. I charge you, therefore, to hold on and hold out, because in the shortest possible time, it will bring you through the wilderness into your promised land. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for your word that we have received today. Thank you for your truth that has come to illuminate our pathway in destiny. We ask, O oh God, that this word will transform our hearts and enable us to align ourselves with your will for our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus, we receive grace to endure even until the end that we may overcome and reign with you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. God bless you and see you in the next episode.